Hey everyone, on this week's episode of NY Seed Round, I have Dorothy Chang. On top of being one of the world's best community organizers for tech, she's also a prominent tech leader here in New York and has quite the resume. She previously served as president at Code with Glossy, an organization that's dedicated to helping young women and non-binary youth break into STEM and engineering. Today, she is one of the leads at a new fund called Next Wave NYC. She recently co-founded Lynx Collective, which is a new community dedicated to startup founders here in New York, helping them bridge connections with investors that are here in the city and helping them learn tactical things like how to hire better, how to raise funding, and how to operate their company successfully. On this episode, we cover a lot of ground, like why tech and startups specifically feel so inaccessible to many, and what can we all do from founders, operators, and investors to ensure there's more diversity and inclusion in the startup environment. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Dorothy as much as I did, and let me know down in the comments, who's an underdog founder you think deserves more attention for what they're building? Thank you so much for joining me. I'm super excited to talk to you about Lynx Collective and then a major problem in tech, which is how <laughs> we can create more avenues for more diverse founders to start companies, get more funding, get more attention that they ultimately deserve. But first, what is Lynx Collective? Lynx Collective is a community of startup founders and aspiring founders. Um, we we specifically talk talk about both founders and aspiring founders because mm -hmm. that's where we're focused on the very earliest stages of startups. Um, a lot of people are thinking about their ideas um, and what they want to build. Um, and it can be hard to actually go and start doing it, mm. especially if you don't know other founders or you've never seen one that looks like you and you don't identify with, you know, the portrait that you see in the news all the time. So what we do is we bring together anybody who is starting a company and is at the early stage, whether you are still working full time and, and just dabbling on the side or you've already raised your seed funding or anything in between and you're just looking for a community of other founders to, you know, have a team to work together, basically, right? It's supportive other people that you see working on similar things as you. We provide programming. So we do a lot of speaker series. Um, we have a series, for example, called Inside VC, hmm. where we tour all the different VCs in New York City. And, and That's great. That's like a that. rare opportunity for founders. Yeah, I think it's pretty yeah. cool. We kicked off with Union Square Ventures. Wow. and had over 400 founders sign up for the event. We couldn't fit them all, unfortunately, yeah. but we're going to go, you know, and try to bring everybody through all the different VCs that they should know. You know, we do founder talks, we do workshops, like very tactical, like, okay, how do you actually hire talent if that's the first time you're doing it for your own company, right? Like these kinds of tactical things. But, you know, of course, the Slack community, we do office hours, we bring in outside experts. And, and so it's a lot of programming events and and community building we host these peer group circles for founders so they can kind of be matched with five to eight other founders at the same stage of as they are um and they can learn and grow together so that's kind of what it is gotcha so what the, the major problems that it's it's aiming to solve is one mentorship connections uh, learning different experiences, whether it's pitching investors. Is there any other aspect to, to what you're trying to solve with Link Select? Yeah, I think it's creating access for founders to meaningful information, knowledge, resources, and community. That makes sense. Um, I want to read a tweet that you recently uh, posted. It uh -huh. was, we've seen so many people struggle to bring their ideas to life because they ha didn't have the right support or network. Why do you think that that's such a make or break thing for founders? Yeah. I think this is true for a lot of people trying to do something really big and hard, whether that's starting a new company or a movement or run for office yeah. or write a book. If you don't know personally somebody else who has done it and it's only something you read about from afar, it's much harder for you to imagine yourself doing it. Um, it's hard to be what you can't see. Right. And if you've also only ever seen people that don't look like you, doing that kind of thing, it might feel like it's not for you either. So what we're trying to do is help people kind of see that that can be them. Mm -hmm. um, the world of technology is, is so democratized now, right? If you have access to the internet, you can learn anything. You can learn how to code. You can learn how to build anything. There's tons of information and blogs and podcasts that can teach you all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but how to actually get started and take that first step is a lot harder. 
um, and how to keep going. And if you're a solo founder or, or even if you have a co-founder, but there's one or two of you and you're alone and you're in this time of life where everyone's particularly lonely, yeah. especially post COVID, um, it can be really challenging. So I think that's that's really kind of what it is. It's it's really hard to do. It's really hard to get started. It's really hard to keep going. Um, and I think all of those things are more accessible um, when you can see a bunch of other people doing it too. The Union Square Ventures event, I think, is a good example of you know you had a packed house. So there's strong demand, and you're like serving a need that was underserved previously. So first, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Second thing is community as a word. I feel does get thrown around a lot. Yeah. And it's always recommended. You need to build a community. Mm. What makes good versus great communities? What are the mistakes that people make when they're curating one? Because you have a very successful one. I don't know about that. <laughs> We're I've, I've seen it. it but I've thank seen you. It. Yeah. Um, I think the word community means, uh, I, I think there's two big buckets for how we think about community. A lot of brands talk about building a community. And oftentimes what they really have is an audience, right? They have... Um, customers or consumers that buy their product and read their tweets or see their Instagram, you know, they get emails from them. But those people don't necessarily come together in some way, right? Um, and so I think that the way brands think about community is a little bit different. And mm -hmm. there are ways to create more of that community and lifestyle um, and relationship, but largely it's, it's really more of an audience. In our case, we uh, community is our primary focus, right? We are trying to build this community of people who all um, care and support each other and um, are vested in each other's success. And that's what it's built on. Um, if you come to Lynx Collective and you join us, um, you agree that you're going to keep everything you hear from others confidential. Okay. Yeah. You're good. And, and that makes you able to be open about what's really going on and the struggles that you have and the challenges. Um, and then you can really relate to each other and really help each other out on a deeper level than, um, you know, just when you meet somebody at an event. And, you know, there's a lot of bravado and posturing that people often have in public, yeah. right? It's a really different kind of tone. Um, everybody wants to be crushing it all the time. Like, yeah, we're doing awesome. We're growing. But and then, in, you know, behind closed doors, what what's the real story and what do you need help with? That's the conversation we want to focus on. Yeah, I'm learning that as we go as well. Like you, you want to make sure that events aren't just events for their own sake, but it's like like we're running an event with an investor coming up and it's the pitch to founders to come is you'll get a chance to meet some investors that you otherwise maybe don't have connections with and practice your pitch. Mm -hmm. Like you have to make something really useful for people. Yeah. Um, I guess people like hanging out too, but you, you want them to <laughs> take something away, you know? Yeah. That's what we think about. I mean, there's, there's of course a place for socializing too, and that's yeah. very helpful yeah. and fun and, and necessary to feed our souls. Yeah. Um, but what we are focused on is really meaningful connections and, and time well spent um, for, you know, the very busy founder that doesn't have a lot of time. So speaking to a like a potentially first time founder who maybe doesn't have a bunch of connections mm -hmm. is one of these underdog founders that, you know, you talk about a lot. Yeah. Can you walk me through some example scenarios or problems that Lynx Collective has helped members solve? Yeah. So the help that our members get comes from a, a bunch of different places too, right? They, it comes from each other in their peer groups people talking to each other. It comes from me and my co-founder and partner, Andrew. We do some coaching with them. And it comes from um, the speakers and outside experts that we bring in for talks and office hours and workshops. Um, so they get help from a lot of different places and, and access to a lot of different resources. Um, and I think that the help that they get from us um, fall into probably three different general buckets. There's the very strategic, there's the very tactical, and then there's the very emotional. Right. Um, and I think when people join, they tend to join looking for the strategic and the tactical, but sometimes the emotional is what ends up being the most valuable. Like tactical being like how to build a better you know, pitch, how to uh, have a better first time investor meeting, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What should my pitch strategy be or my, my, my fundraising strategy be? At what time should I go out to who? Or even what should I use 
you know, as an HR platform or, or which lawyer can I get better rates from, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a lot of our members have saved a ton of money just talking through their legal strategy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then strategic might be more of, you know, when do I quit my job? Like, when do I know I found product market fit? Do I need a co-founder or not? How do I, how do I quit my co-founder? You know, things like that. Um, and then the emotional side is, am I the only crazy one over here? Why does everybody in my life think I'm crazy? What do you guys think? Yeah. Or, um, this is, this is much harder than I thought it was going to be. Do you feel the same way? Mm -hmm. And when you know, six other people are nodding their heads and yeah. said, I'm going through the same thing as you. Um, it makes it that much more um, palatable. Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, I attended a panel earlier this year that was run by Charlie O'Donnell. And one of the speakers, she talked about how, you know, many investors, she's in the health tech space and it's a, you know, a women's health platform. Yeah. And many, many investors are men. They don't, many of them don't get it. Mm -hmm. Or I think this, this is what she said. She said, a lot of the investors say, like, let me go ask my wife mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Yeah. And one of the most groundbreaking things for her has been I have this Slack group full of 30 other health tech founders that yeah. are just like me, where we root each other on, we share these experiences. But also, we have a list of investors who get it. Mm -hmm. So I can see the connections you're making here and, and why community can be important for somebody in that position. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's... There's great spaces like that that are designed for, you know, this is health tech founders or this is female founders or this is um, Gen Z founders yeah. or, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of affinity groups like that. Um, I think those are are helpful for getting, um, you know, kind of that empathy from other people who are going through exactly what you're going through. Um, Lynx Collective in particular, we try to keep it really diverse. Yeah. Um, because I think that's also really important. Um, and we know that's true within companies and organizations and boards, right? That more diverse perspectives are going to help a company be stronger. So that's kind of the take that we're, that we have too. Um, I think it's really important for people to have people that don't look like them also yeah. and to yeah. hear from them and hear how they approach different things. Um, uh, you know, whoever you are, getting that more well-rounded, diverse set of of, of perspectives um, is really additive and valuable. That makes sense. Um, I do not hide that I love uh, New York, especially the future of like the tech scene. Like, I have a lot of friends that are here. And uh, you recently tweeted about a data point that I also saw, <laughs> which is New York just dethroned Bay Area in Q1 for most pre-seed pre -seed, seed stage founders. Yeah. And you said, it's working. <laughs> what do you think is working? I mean... To be totally honest, it's a little bit of a joke because I think all of those stats are constantly changing all the time in New York and the, you know, San Francisco, Silicon Valley area are always rivaling each other for whether it's like the number of tech workers or the number of... This is not a joke, Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> the number of, um, you know, funded companies or the amount of yeah. funding that they raised or I think it goes back and forth a lot. Mm -hmm. and And you know what? like go where you're called to right yeah. like for me I've always I've always um, worked in New York and I've worked with people all over the place but I've always been based in the New York area um, and that's where I will always be and I love it um, and I've spent plenty of time in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley and I don't want to live there personally <laughs> well, what makes New York City's ecosystem special to you there's so many reasons I mean there's one just the general what New York City is um, as a city, right? No comparison in terms of the diversity of, of people, things to do, culture, you know, apex in so many different industries. There's a lot of energy in so many different areas. Um, the people are ambitious and tough and passionate and alive, right? It's just a different energy that you'll ever feel in New York versus, you know, any, any other city in the US at least. Um, and then in terms of working in tech, like there's kind of similar analogous um, benefits too from working in tech in New York versus working in tech in San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Um, because there's so much diversity in this city, there are people coming from all different places with so many different perspectives, building for um, you know different industries, different use cases, solutions, problems, and people. Um, and it's just 
richer that way and more interesting, more engaging, right? Um, and I think that uh, it's a, it's a different experience if you if you work and live in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. That's a very industry town, and um, it's very easy for that to become yeah. your entire life. I've also heard from several founders where they they were in San Francisco, but they came to New York, and that was the first time they got customers. Like, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm sort of toying with this narrative of like go to go to Bay Area to build your you know your algorithms, but come to New York to find your customers. Yeah. It's like I talked to Andrew first, who's a founder at Plannery, and he, you know, they're solving a medical debt, which is a huge issue. Yeah. Their first customer is SUNY Hospital which is here in New York. And you have a ton of like diverse industries that potentially you don't have in Bay Area to find customers, especially if you're building in vertical SaaS. Mm -hmm. I think that is, um, you know, a lot of brands are represented here in so many different ways and every large corporation has an office here. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this is where you're going to be able to, you know, meet a density of a lot of different people very quickly um, and of a lot of, from a lot of different companies. Um, but also like that, um, being exposed to to the diversity of ideas and people is huge if you're building a company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of analogous to how psych. We were just talking about psychology yeah. in college, right? Like, I I studied cognitive science. All the psych studies are done on eighteen to twenty two year olds, right? Right. And college students who, but they're from completely different northeast colleges, right? I mean, right. it's it's very one note. So you're only going to get a very narrow perspective, and you have to widen that aperture if you're building a product that's meant to be for more people other than just the people who are other techies, you know, yeah, in San Francisco. Um, so I want to switch gears. So yeah. um, I'm focused on helping where I can, like, build community here in New York. And yeah. I think one of the big reasons I want to talk to you is how can we both, you know, operators, founders, mm -hmm. investors, yeah. Um, do more to support more diverse founders coming up in the NYC ecosystem. Yeah. I think it strengthens it. Yeah. Um, my first question is, yeah. you were actually president of Code with Cloth. Yeah. What did that time teach you about issues or challenges around getting more diversity in STEM education in the first yeah. place? Yeah. I mean, that was just a wild experience, really. I mean, our program was teaching um, four or 5,000 young women and gender expansive youth every single year mm -hmm. and uh, you know giving offering a two week long free coding class summer camp for them right and we had some other programs as well the summer camp is the is the main one um and being able to see those thousands of young people start with some idea no knowledge of coding most of them um some of them had never touched a computer even yeah. right um learn how to code the first week and then the second week, build a website or a mobile app that they were passionate about. Uh, I mean, it was it was an incredible experience to see that happen. In the course of two weeks, by the end, they've built something that's real and tangible and they can put out into the world that, um, you know, is an extension of who they are and what they care about. And you realize that, uh, you know, hearing from all of them, too, about their experiences, because some, some of them had tried. Some of them had tried taking coding in school or tried going to the robotics you know, extracurricular club and yeah. they get there and they're the only woman and, and they're, some of them are explicitly told, you're never going to be that good because you're a girl. Right. Things like that. That's not a great learning environment, right? But then when you're so surrounded by a supportive group of other people who are all learning how to do the same thing and you're all cheering each other on and you don't feel like the one weirdo, suddenly things change and they can do anything and they come out so empowered. And so I really learned a lot from that experience, seeing that a really supportive environment and community of people who care about each other's success can make a huge difference. Um, and if thousands of young people can go through this experience and know how to code and be so curious about technology after that, you know, the majority of them go on to college and major or minor in computer science or engineering. Mm -hmm. um, that's over 70% of them, which is crazy. Like in yeah. colleges right now, only three or 4%. Um, of women major or minor in, in, in those degrees. So, um, so it's, it's just like early exposure. Earlier yeah. exposure. Community. A, community, the right environment. Other people are like me and you're doing this. Exactly. Product. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. So I think um, that's what kind of inspired me to build Links Collective 
because I saw all of these really passionate young people who wanted to build something. And they came out at the end of the experience. Some of them, of course, are like, you know, happy to go become an engineer somewhere. And they do. And they become, you know, eventually they go to college and then they become an engineer at Meta and Deloitte and Goldman Sachs and, you know, huge corporations that they never would have stepped foot in. Otherwise, it's a huge leap for them. But there were also a ton of them who wanted to continue working on their project yeah. and didn't know how, didn't know how to take it from this idea and this project to an ongoing product or company. And they didn't know where to start and they didn't know anybody else that was doing it. And it seemed like such a far away dream. So that's part of why we built Links Collective was to create more of that pathway to entrepreneurship that anybody can kind of like just get plugged in and get access to all those resources and and know how and other people doing it too so it feels more accessible um i think that what as a as an ecosystem tech ecosystem overall what we don't know is who's not in it right like who is out there that like wants to make that leap and hasn't gotten there yet and that's what we're trying to you know, create more of a pathway for. So I think that's the thing um, that if you're focused really early stage, if you're an investor that is, um, you know, looking at pre-seed or angel or or whatever else, like really early stage, that's the thing to be kind of mindful of is like, how can I find those people and draw them in? The people who are really high potential, um, you know, really driven, growth mindset, like they have something they want to solve and how can I find them and reach them and, and pull them in? Um, that's where you're going to find a ton of opportunity. And, and so that's that's where that tweet originated that you were talking about was, you know, that study that showed that actually, you know, underdog founders, women, people of color, immigrants made up a majority of the unicorns that were formed in the past few years. Um, and yet they're getting at the beginning stages so much smaller of a, a slice of the pie of investment. Um, so we need to pay more attention, yeah. not just because it's the right thing to do. And not just because it's going to make the world a better place by, you know, um, supporting different ideas and 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 people, but also because it's going to be really lucrative. I mean, there's a lot of overlooked opportunity there, um, and it's just it's totally untapped. It makes sense. You in in that response you mentioned going on to work at Meta, going on to work at yeah. Deloitte, and that sort of thing. But why do you feel like startups feel so inaccessible to some? I think if you imagine yourself as a college student and there's on-campus recruiting and there's large corporations that come and do job fairs and interviews right on campus for you, right? Um, they're trying to recruit you hard and you're hearing about what that life is going to be like and you see graduates from your school come back and tell you about it. And it, so it feels very accessible, right? And you can picture it too and they're telling you unlimited food and vacation and yeah. you know all you have to do is code all day and you get to work on these cool projects and solve problems and you're working at one of the biggest companies in the world that's very attractive and nobody there is coming on campus to tell you hey do you have a dream do you want a really hard life yeah. <laughs> do you want to do it all by yourself yeah and all the time <laughs> do you want to have a lot of anxiety yeah. you know the sleep that you're getting you're not going to get any of it. yeah <laughs> and do you want to like not know if you're going to get paid or not yeah it's right. you know nobody's actually trying to pull you into that it has to be coming from within yourself yeah and um, and if you've got it within yourself then you know that's important that's the only way you're going to build something meaningful. You have to be extremely self-driven and resourceful. Um, so it's good to have a little help. Right? What do you think are tactical things that underdog founders can do to tack, like overcome that? Again, I think the power of community is huge. It doesn't mean you have to join Links Collective, you but you do have to seek it out. And if you can find a few other friends that are in the same boat as you and just put some structure around how you meet regularly, it's going to help you all out a ton. Um, so that's one thing that you can do, right? Like find other people like you, meet with them regularly, actually help each other out, share what you're working on. Um, and then you also need to find, you know, people who have done it before and, you know, mentors and try to meet investors. And you have to try to meet as many people as you can who have played those roles that, um, that you're playing, who might invest in you, who might be your customers. Um, you just have to really kind of get out of your comfort zone and and go for it and, and believe that you can do it. 
um, it's important to have a support system around you for that. That makes sense. You recently joined NextWave NYC, and feel free to share what that is. But uh, what role do investors play in this problem? Yeah. Okay. So two two things. First of all, NextWave NYC is a pre-seed fund fully backed by Flybridge Capital, which typically invests at the seed stage. So Next Wave is made up of 14 of us partners who are all full-time working in the startup world as founders and operators in other ways. Um, but we have the ability to write checks for this pre-seed fund, 50K about. Um, if two of us decide to write a check, we can write the check. But it's coming, it's, you know, it's coming out of Flybridge's right. funds. Um, and um, and we're focused on New York City startups and um, folks who are innovating in AI, which is like the next big explosive wave. It's called Cerebral Alley. <laughs> so um, so that's that's what Next Wave is. Um, and what role do investors play in diversifying the industry? So again, I think it comes back to like it, it they shouldn't be doing it because they feel like they should or because it's the right thing to do. Um, at the end of the day, uh, investors need to make returns for their LPs. That's their sole job to do. Um, and I just think that they should pay attention to where those opportunities are that often get overlooked. Hmm. Um, and so that's where the underdog founders are, are not getting as much attention, maybe not getting as much hype. Um, what are the reasons for that? What are the biases that we have that are preventing us from investing at that early stage in those founders? Um, and and what is it that is holding us back that actually doesn't matter? Right. Um, so I, I think that's what investors have to be thinking about. And you also made the point earlier about it sort of makes a business case when you look at the actual data of exactly. the reports that have exited. Yeah. Got it. Are there like two, like you mentioned, challenging our biases, uh, rethinking how we source deals? Mm -hmm. Are there two to three tactical things you would recommend to an investor, you know, that may be practices that may be limiting their ability to do that? On a strategic level, um, you kind of kind of have to take a, a bigger step back and, and look at the structure of your partnership and your fund. Men tend to invest in men. Women tend to invest in women. If your partnership is more diverse your deal flow is going to be more diverse too. And so that's a big, you know, difference that um, investors can think about. Um, if they uh, raise funds from diverse funds as well, they're going to allocate in more diverse ways too. Mm -hmm. So who you're raising from, who you are, and who you're investing in all kind of play a role in um, helping you to be in a position to find those opportunities and, and this, you know, Diamond to the rough. Right. Part of Lynx Collective's mission is building community for, you know, underdog founders. I, I have, as an observation, I have been at events where there's prominent VCs mm -hmm. that happen to be women on stage and they'll say something to the extent of, I don't really do women events or women only events. It's sort of this, like, they don't want to be associated with that part yeah. of their identity. Yeah. What's your reaction to that and what's the right response to that? Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one is just the general thing of um, who's being put on stage on, at conferences um, needs to be done. That needs to be done in a more thoughtful way. Um, you know, it's often men um, that are dominating the stage. And that happens for a lot of reasons. It's not just because women are getting overlooked by conference organizers. Often women don't put themselves up to do the speaking or they're asked and they say, no, they don't want to do it. Like there's, there's a thing there too, that women are responsible for and, and, and they need to speak up and get up on stage too. But the larger problem is generally conference organizers tend to, you know, pull together panels and, and then whoops, they're not diverse at all. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's a complete afterthought. Um, and for some reason, you know, this just keeps happening. And so Women are trying to take more of a stand, men too, but women are taking trying to take more of a stand and say, I'm not going to do a panel where I'm just there on the woman panel instead of on the AI panel or the healthcare panel where I can talk about the exciting, interesting work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just talk about being a woman in this industry. But I think it's also incumbent on men to say, I'm not going to be on a panel that's only men because mm -hmm. like. It just doesn't make sense. It's not going to be interesting and engaging. And that's another thing, too. I think panels often are just kind of people agreeing with each other. And it's going to be 
more interesting for the audience too, if you you're, if you have conflicting and in, in differing perspectives. So we need a, a diversity of perspectives on stage at conferences too. The other thing um, that I wanted to talk about, there is so much inherent bias baked into venture capital that women who raise money from female investors solely tend to raise less money the next round than if they raised money from a diverse set of investors. And I think what's going on there is that- Well, well first, what are the ramifications of that decision? You raise less money yeah. or, or you don't raise your next round, right? Right. right. And, and part of that is, let's say you're a series A fund and you're looking at these seed stage startups coming through and you see that these were only invested in by, you know, female focused funds or or whatever other kind of equity focused funds. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bias that you only got invested in because you're a woman, but were you good enough to get investments from these other funds, these other marquee funds, right? So there's a bias there, um, and and I think that that becomes a little bit problematic too. So founders actually have to think about who they're raising from and making sure that they're raising from great tier one funds, no matter who they are, and that they have a diversity of investors um, because it's it's important for them for that next round. And so if you are, you know, similarly only doing women conferences and you're only talking to, um, you're only seen as like a woman who invests in women it's I, like it, it. It hurt. It pains me so much to 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 talk about this, um, but it really hurts you as an investor, as a founder, um, and so it's important actually to to show that you can compete on a on, you know on a high level, no matter who you're competing with. Gotcha. Yeah, I ask because uh, raising the most amount of money isn't necessarily the right approach, especially if you raise totally, too much money totally, and that totally. sort of thing. I, yeah, I was curious, like, yeah. what are the ramifications of that? Kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but you do want to, the ability to raise money, right? right. You right. you don't want to um, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. That makes sense. What what can founders be doing better right now to be a part of this? Uh, you know, the solution to this problem. Like I, I'm thinking from the perspective of like we're a startup here in New York. Yeah. Sh and to your point, we probably don't have the money to go to universities in all 50 states. But like, should we build a connection with a local university here, like mm -hmm. NYU? Like, what are some tactical things that founders can do? Who one of their decisions is overseeing the type of talent that works at their startup. Again, it's like it has to be at every level. So, um, uh, you know, your is your board diverse? Mm -hmm. Is your executive team diverse? Um, do you have, you know, diverse leaders? And I mean diversity in all the different ways. I don't just mean for women, but also people of color, immigrants, all and all of the other, you know, categories of, of people that tend to get overlooked in, in technology, um, it's important to be thoughtful about who you're talking to at all of those levels, about making sure when you are hiring um, that you don't have a bias towards a certain specific prototype. You're just as aggressively going out to different communities. If you're if you're if you are recruiting from top colleges, then make sure that HBCUs are part of that set of colleges that you're mm -hmm. recruiting from. It's important for so many different reasons, not just because it's the right thing to do. It is, um, but also because it's going to make your company stronger. Um, it's going to give you a better perspective overall. You're going to be more successful if you have more diverse perspectives. Um, and so it's important to do that. And for startups, they have to start thinking about it early on because if you end up being really skewed in one direction or another, it's really hard to walk that back as you continue to grow. It starts to perpetuate itself. If there's like, you know, in a sea of engineers, there's only one female engineer, it's going to be really hard to recruit the second one. Right. That makes sense. Um, while you're here, you are a brilliant comms, a marketing person. <laughs> uh, I feel like startups are leaning more into like building communities as mm -hmm. an effective like marketing strategy. Yeah. How do they do it well? It's like, it's not as basic as like starting a Slack channel and, but like yeah. use Row as an example, like we serve as CFOs, like give me the right way to think about building community <laughs> in that case. Is it starting a Slack and just, you know, sending a bunch of blogs about your products to them? Like, tell me how to build an effective community as a, if you're a founder, yeah. trying to do so. If, I mean, I think it's different for everybody, but let's say we're talking about it for Row. 
and you are servicing CFOs specifically, then you should be thinking hard about how can you add value to a CFO's life and work um, in a way that only Roe uniquely can, right? right? And so throwing everybody to Slack is is a thing that you can do, um, but are they already in some other Slack? Do they want probably. another Slack? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> probably, probably not. <laughs> um, what is it that that you can do that's actually going to help them? And then, you know, if they, whether they are already in a Slack or not, what are the ways that you can bring them together to add value to each other yeah. um, that's not happening already today? Um, and how can you do that authentically? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I, I learned a ton during this conversation and, and appreciate you taking time out to chat with me. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Awesome. Thanks, Dorothy.